welcome to my channel. I'm Tracy Harding and today in my writer's space, Ike Flintart is dropping in for a bit of a visit and a chat about her latest book, Blackbird Sing, and some of her other works as well. And um, if you're on Facebook, you follow me there, then you'll know that I've been raving about Blackbird Sing um, because I got to read it before everybody else and it was just such a fantastic book that I thought I'll get Ike in for an interview because I think more people should know about her work. But before we talk to her, let's find out a little bit more about her. Ike Flintart is a Brisbane author who's had a lot of success self-publishing. Her book series include 80 AD, which is her young adult series, the Kalimar Chronicles, Iron, Fire and Steel, the Ruan Shi Urban Fantasy series, and her latest novel, Blackbird Sing, which is also a Ruan Shi novel. Aiki also writes short stories, uh, works on collaborations, and has had her work featured in several anthologies. She does this around a full-time job, doing martial arts, archery, painting, belly dancing, and playing several musical instruments. So let's find out how she does it all. So here we are in my writing space with Ike Flintart. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having yeah. me. And what we're going to talk about first is what made you want to become a writer? Oh, I've always written. I still have my really terrible stories from when I was like, 10 and 12 and I just I've just always written and when I was in my 20s it was terrible romances yeah yeah um well, we all did terrible yeah romances. I think so <laughs> did you have rock bands as well rock bands oh yeah well, I had rock bands in mind we, we we were a bit fascinated with Duran Duran when we were young rock actually bands. Kim Wilkins as well she's guilty of that as well but yeah, yeah. No, no, mine were always action adventure ones because I've always been a bit of an action junkie. So, you know, yeah. I'm a I'm a bungee jumper, spelunker, diver, <laughs> that sort of person. So Tomb Raider. Yeah, so my heroines were always action junkies. And I actually did end up turning one of those romances into a, a, a proper book, like you know, publishing it. But apart from that, yeah, I've just I've just always written, always, just always loved to tell stories. Yeah, and, and were you a storyteller as well? Did you tell your friends stories when you were young or did you just write them down? Just, just wrote them down, yeah. yeah. I wasn't a – I'm an introvert naturally, so, yeah, it's, it's not so much having other people um, be part of my stories as just loving – the characters and and the worlds and being inside their heads and getting in other people's heads and understanding them. Yeah, I got like that later on. I mean, initially I was a, a storyteller because I couldn't spell, so I <laughs> didn't I didn't think about writing them down. So I was just sort of storytelling instead. But um, what time of day do you like to write? I mostly am an evening person. That's right, because you've got another job as well. I do. You? I run a business, yeah. yes. But interestingly, the way you said that uh, you couldn't spell, the reason I started writing seriously was because my son turned out to be dyslexic. And he was really struggling with the big um, fat books like Harry Potter and that sort of stuff. He wanted to read them. Mm but they were just too much for him. Yeah. And so I wrote uh, the ADAD series. Hang on, got to work out which way to go, that way. There I wrote the ADAD series, which was uh, a portal fantasy for young adults, for kids. Yeah. And he loved it. He, so there's a series of five of those and then all of his friends loved it. And I went, well, maybe I should do this writing thing seriously. And then they've had about 400,000 downloads. That's, um, that's amazing. I think that's about as many books as I've actually sold in my whole career. So that's pretty well done. <laughs> well, I have to be honest, the initial upload, they were up for free for a couple of weeks. Uh, just because. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I wanted to get them out there. Exactly. But then they got so much momentum that I went, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I should write more and, and do this seriously. So where do, you, where do you squeeze it in then? Do you sort of do wee hours or late at night or? Uh, I tend to write mostly once I get home from work, I'll, I'll play my lute for a little while because I'm learning to play As the lute. You As you do, you play your lute. Yeah, and, and I throw knives for a while because and that's. And throw knives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and then once I'm done with that, I'll uh, I'll sit and write for a couple of hours generally. So it's it, only a couple of hours a night because yeah, that's all you get time for. And and how many words do you chug out in a couple of hours? Hmm, 
not that many, maybe only about a thousand or so. Yeah, but that's what I've been doing in a day lately. I'm a bit distracted, but you know, I have. It's been difficult. It's okay. Um, anyway, so um, characters. Have you got a favourite character in your books that you kind of fell in love with? I have to admit the the series Iron, um, Iron Fire and Steel. My favourite character is Ket, who's the the the. The hero, if you like, he's the, he's not the protagonist, but he's the secondary character. Um, the heroine is Alir, and um, they have a really great equal relationship. And he respects her, and he treats her with total equality, and they're both kick-ass. And I just really love their relationship, and I love how he he's her mentor, but still her best friend, and her and I just. He, to be honest, he's he's kind of like my husband. I was just about to say, is that because your husband is so fantastic and treats you so well? So it's kind of bleeding over into the story. Yeah, I have to admit it is a bit. <laughs> That's so nice. So you get a, it's nice, real warm, fuzzy feeling. So it's it's kind of you get that realness. Yeah. We don't need them to be better or you know stronger or physically better we just need them to be equal. And that's what and, and the thing is, is that women will quite often come up with different solutions you know that men might not have thought of so you get the equality that way as well as long as you have men that actually listen to what they're saying (laughs) which helps in real life too guys just saying um so what's um let's have it let's have a chat about this one because you do research obviously you do a lot of research okay and so Ike not only does research she writes research (laughs) um so tell us a bit about fight like a girl yeah, I've done martial arts for about 20 years. So I do a martial art called Yoshinkan Aikido, which is like what Steven Seagal does, but without the bad acting. Right, okay, cool. Um, it's it's also the martial art that's used by the Tokyo Women's Police uh, because it is quite specifically designed for small people. Yeah. Like, you don't have to be physically strong to do it. In fact, sometimes being physically strong is a disadvantage because yeah. you use strength when you it won't work. Yeah, exactly. So I took that experience, that knowledge of 20 years worth of martial arts and as well as Aikido, I do archery and knife throwing because I figure if my characters are going to learn to uh, throw knives and shoot bows, then I should probably do that too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had Tori who was Taekwondo and I actually went and learned Taekwondo as well because I think, yeah, you kind of need that insight into just how difficult things are and um, how you would be in a combat situation and how you would react because it's different when it's actually happening to you because you can theorise. Definitely, definitely. Theory is completely different from reality and that's one of the biggest problems with doing a martial art and never having the experience is that on the dojo you're actually training with people you like and you don't want to hurt them yes so if they tap you stop yeah but in real world if they tap and you stop that's a bad thing (laughs) that's exactly right (laughs) so the other thing that you've got some experience with that my readers would be interested in because some of them are writers is um self-publishing because that's how you got in isn't it And you've been pretty successful at it as well. So what's the lowdown on the self-publishing? It's complicated. (laughs) And there's a lot to it. And you have to have a lot of patience and you have to have a lot of persistence and you have to expect not to be J.K. Rowling. It's, you know, I was incredibly lucky with the timing on ADAD. Uh, I, I popped that up just as Kindle Unlimited and Kindle All started to come onto the market. So I kind of caught that wave and got those 400,000 downloads. And it still trickles, like I still get a nice little income from that. But because I didn't immediately follow it up with books straight away, I lost a lot of that audience because it is a very fickle audience. They will switch and flick and go to somebody new straight away. They're so quick to change. And there's um, a lot of the self-publishers these days, you have to spend, some of them are spending 100 hours a week working as a full-time job. And they're spending five, $6,000 a month on advertising. And most of us can't afford that. Yeah, um, I've found even uh, because, you know, I've been published with Harper for a long time. And even with 
being published with HarperCollins, I mean, authors really are doing a lot more of their own publicity and they're, you know, I mean, we're expected to be active on just about every damn thing which we are, well, we try to do, but it does take away from the writing thing as well, doesn't it? Because you don't get as much time to write. It's taking away from that creative space while you think about that next advertisement that you're supposed to be putting up or that next live that you're supposed to be doing um, or that YouTube video that you're doing and <laughs> that story that you're supposed to be writing. Damn. That story I'm supposed to be writing. No, it's going well. It is. It's really going well. <laughs> so let's talk about... Blackbird sing. You've got a you've got a present for us, haven't you? I do, I do. I figured if somebody would like to be part of a competition, you Yay. get a copy of Blackbird Sing with your own little sword bookmark. See? Yeah. To match oh, my little sword earrings. Oh, look, it's a purple <laughs> it's a purple one too. I've got a I've got a green one. Yes. And and thanks to your kind intervention, Belinda have uh, taken this up and they're going to turn it into an auto audio book, which is fabulous. Mind you, they also want the sequel in a hurry, and I'm like, yeah, I haven't written the sequel yet. <laughs> and have we? I mean, we've had ideas about the sequel, yeah. Yeah, the sequel's plotted. It's yeah. just a matter of actually writing it because it's you know it's 24. This one's 24 different female characters. The sequel's going to be 16 different female characters, uh, and a, a different nursery rhyme because it's based around the nursery rhyme blackbirds sing, obviously. Which is you know four and twenty blackbirds yeah. baked in a pie. Which I'd totally forgotten until I read this book. And then it was just so brilliant the way that each line from this poem was a different chapter title for a different woman in the book. This is why I was so impressed. It was like the, the planning. Like, was the did you sit there and plot it out for like, you know, ages beforehand? Well, I, I had the poem and I, each line of the poem kind of leads you quite naturally to an occupation for a woman. So four and 20 blackbirds, that, that girl was a, a poacher. She was, you know, hunting blackbirds. Um, <laughs> baked in a pie, there's your baker. Um, and when the pie was opened, there, oh, I can't remember what that one was. Yeah, that's right, the again to sing, we had Yes, a singer. Singers. So it was it was really fun working out because I started by working out the occupations and then I had to work out what the conflict for each of that character was going to be to suit that occupation. And then each one also had to fit in with the overarching conflict, which was an attempt by some bad guys to kill Henry Tudor, the Henry the Seventh. And working it all in together and making it all mesh and making sure each short story stands alone but still advances the overarching plot, that was challenging. Look, it was a brilliant piece of storytelling. I was absolutely just so impressed. My mind was completely blown. And everyone I have told to go and read this book has just come back to me and gone, oh, my God, you know, including my agent, you know. So there's some, you know, people out there that have been really, really fairly impressed. And so absolutely go and read it and not only that you know I had some people say oh I get the ebook first just to make sure I like it well don't get the hardcover because the hardcover has some beautiful artwork which I'm going to put up on the screen it's probably going to go across while I'm sitting here waving and um, it's absolutely gorgeous so um, definitely check that one out and we're going to have a competition I'm going to put it up when I put up um, this interview I will also Pulled up the competition and um, you can win a copy of Blackbird Sing, cool. which will be fantastic. So, with the self, so where do you get your hardcovers from? If you're self published, are you bringing them in from the US? No, no, it's uh, it's with oh my god, I'm just totally blank. Ingram Spark, oh, so I've read in, about yeah, them. Ingram Spark is uh, light. There's a company called Lightning Source, which is the bigger version that deals with uh, like large publishing companies. Mm -hmm. And then there's their self-publishing arm, which is called Ingram Spark. And you basically get on, you upload it yourself, you format it, and you just order copies. So, God, that's excellent to know because, you know, we may all be doing that soon. <laughs> because it seems to be, I've spoken to a lot of um, self-published authors, and a lot of them are making a lot more money self-publishing yep. than they are going through the 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 you know the big five even um and some people um like when i was talking to nick and allison Lockle, they were saying they actually pulled their deal because they were actually doing a better job themselves so this is why i i love i've done the same thing i've actually turned down three publishing deals 
Yeah. Just because the the deal wasn't good enough. It was like, I can earn that much doing it all myself and you're not doing any more marketing than I could do. And you don't have to argue with the publicity. Right. <laughs> and, and I don't have to argue over the covers and because like all of these covers I've had you know, input into. Um, the Blackbird Sing one is actually painted by my stepmother. It's absolutely one. gorgeous. Yeah. Um, actually, I'll put it up on the screen so you can see it closely, but it is absolutely beautiful. And, w and did she do the artwork inside as well? No, the artwork inside is done by one of my members of my writers group who is a digital artist and she was very kind and did those for me and each and because I, I wanted each woman to have her own individual identity and because there's 24 different women it helps readers to have that visual image of what the character looks like up front. What I found when I was actually reading it too is there's these little symbols for each one of the the characters as well so um, because they were short stories, I found it really easy to sort of read a couple every night and then come back to it the next night and read a couple. And because of the little symbols, you could remember who it was that you just read, which was just a really, really clever on your behalf and on the, the, the um, animator's behalf that as well. Was a, that was actually all Caitlin's idea, the, the illustrator. She came up with that and she made it look so beautifully like stained glass and it just suited the style so nicely. I was really excited. It was like, ah, oh, yay! It was absolutely gorgeous. So, about the next one. So, do we have a title for the next one? Yes, it's Blackbird's Return because it's set a century later in the Elizabethan era oh, and really? it's it's going to be so much fun because it's a, it's Elizabeth versus Grace O'Malley who's the Irish pirate queen. Oh, awesome. Yes, so the two of them are going to be having this kind of con uh, conflict basically because it is kind of at that era it is Ireland versus England oh yeah and uh, and there's a lot of argy bargy going on between them and Spain and all these different things I'm so glad you didn't say Mary Queen of Scots because that's been done to death but oh my god the Irish pirate queen that sounds fantastic and Elizabeth won't be a point of view character but Grace will be one of the main point of view characters and uh, and then a couple of descendants of these from Blackbird Singh will be in it Oh, because it, the, the whole idea is that it's a it's now a group of women whose job is to protect the monarchy right. and through the ages so the idea is to have six books and, and eventually they will connect in with the Shadows Wake series up here whoops as a modern urban, urban fantasy so they are all in the same universe Right. Okay. So, yeah, and, it, and then eventually, and there's another book I'm writing called Reset, which is uh, possibly Reset Working Title, which is in the same universe as well. Um, but all three series will come together in the end in a final epic battle, save the world kind of thing. Awesome. Which, so there's like, I've got seven books to write. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And they're all periods. So how do you i mean when you've got like 24 female characters how do you name them all well with blackbird sing i went google medieval names <laughs> <laughs> and then because i wanted to have as many as possible with different starting initials yes, so exactly. there's there's not too many rep repetitions and you get some really odd line ones like there's one there called sciencia <laughs> what the hell that was a medieval name yeah. what really <laughs> And because it's that breakover between medieval and Tudor, I was trying to, to find names that fit both the Anglo-Saxon era and the Tudor era because they do actually change slightly over yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that period. Uh, but now the next book is going to, it's firmly in the Elizabethan era, so we're, we're talking standard biblical type names now, so that's not too hard. Fantastic. And what about for your, because you've got, this one's young adult, is it? The one that's right behind yeah. me? Yeah. Well, adult, adult, um, it, adult, young adult, that one, that one is a future world colony story. So we, and it's Asian inspired. So there's, there's a mixture of names that are Asian, Arabic and English. Right. And the lead character, Alir, was actually, in, the whole story actually came from a customer of mine at work. The company name was Alir. And oh. I went, that's a really cool name. And then my husband was teaching himself blacksmithing. And it suddenly occurred to me, what happens if you have a world, a colony world that's been terraformed, where you've, you've made your colony world, but there's no iron deposits, because I'm a geologist by trade originally. And if you have no history of life as we do on Earth, yeah. 
you have no banded ironstones like we do in Australia, which is where we get our massive iron deposits from. Because oh, okay. iron, banded ironstones, which is our big iron deposits, come from life. It's, it's when the oceans switched over from being at, for anaerobic to aerobic, yeah. all of the iron sort of deposited off into the bottom of the ocean, basically. Right. So if you take that history away, if you take that 4.5 billion years of life away, yeah. you get no iron, you get no chalk, you get no um, flint, you get no coal, you get no oil, you get all of the trappings of industry that we rely on right. are not there. Okay. None of them. So you have to envisage a whole different type of society. Right. But still with some sort of layer of modern technology because they've come from Earth. So they've, they've flown there in spaceships. They've terraformed this planet with life, but it's all modern, which means once their connection with Earth is broken, they have no more mi mineral resources that right. they can rely on. Right, okay. So then you have this stultified society that is... In, that started because it's incredibly peaceful and they wanted it to be peaceful yeah. but then if you throw in an iron deposit suddenly the geopolitics changes <laughs> because now you've got access to iron which gives you access to a whole new type of industry to weapons of war to all of that sort of stuff and that was the premise yeah. so okay you take this incredibly peaceful society with no way of making war and you give them a way of making war. Oh, goody. And that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That's an excellent premise. Okay, so I think that's about everything. But in, in um, finishing up, and this is a question I ask everyone, in your opinion, what's the meaning of life? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I don't know that there is one. I'm going to be absolutely honest. I don't know that there is one. I think... All you can do is be the best person you can possibly be, help the most people you can possibly help, and just live the nicest life you can life with the people that you love. Yeah. So experience would be... Yeah, and in a do stuff. Yeah. Like, don't just sit around being afraid to do things. Yeah. Get off your ass and do things because life is way too short Absolutely. to be afraid you just got to get out there and try stuff and fail. And who cares? Exactly. Who cares? So there's some advice for some aspiring authors as well. So just keep going, you know, yeah. basically. Is that what you did? Yes. Just kept chucking it out. And, yeah. and you, sooner or later, you do get where you're going. Yeah. So that's all from us. Thank you for coming. No problem. Thank you for that. And um, we're going to put that competition up. And in case you're wondering, it's a sword in my oh. hair. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. <laughs> a bit of assassin antics going on. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.